Hello and welcome back. This is Dave. We're going to go through the meeting content from the meeting scheduled for February 16th, 2017. This meeting may be rescheduled due to snow. Who knows what's going to come up? This is all being pre recorded. So the agenda for the meeting in this content is going to include rules 3 and 4, as well as a quick you make the call. I'll be breaking this up into two recorded sessions. You'll see rule 3 posted, and then rule 4 and you make the call are going to be posted in a separate video presentation. So let's get into Rule 3, and we'll try and give you some scenarios and some uh, some cases regarding some of the notes, and there will also be a little bit of uh, quizzes and interactive content, things for you to think about. So let's get in and start with Rule 3.01. 301, before the game begins, the umpires shall. 301B states, be sure that all playing lines, heavily lines, on diagrams numbers 1 and 2 are marked with non-caustic lime chalk or other material legally, easily distinguishable from the ground or grass. Now these lines should be on every field. When you're dealing with little league fields there really should never be a reason not to. However we understand that when you're doing some junior seniors games specifically I'm thinking of East Greenwich High School where the field is managed by somebody other than the little league itself and they are pretty much using it at the mercy or liberty of the other organization you may not have lines you're just gonna have to do the best you can it's always nice to address this in a pregame uh, or excuse me in a plate conference with the managers as well as a pregame if you've got no lines down the right field fan, uh, down the right field foul line you might want to talk about who's got fair foul coverage in that particular instance uh, just because sometimes the plate umpire has a better view. We also want to make sure that we get a supply of baseballs which means the little league specs just make sure that they are labeled uh, LL1 if they're diamonds uh, or if they're RS or RST models if they are Wilson for regular season or regular season tournament. Uh, just don't want to get involved with t-balls and you'll you'll learn quickly enough uh, you don't want them to be senior baseballs you don't want them to be uh, t-ball balls you don't want them to be practice balls generally the coaches are pretty good about it but make sure that you're getting balls now before the game begins and this is 301 e should have possession of at least two alternate balls what does this mean this means that you should be starting the game with three baseballs how many do we get two if you can get a third one out of the coach and we're talking regular season it's kind of a long season and you know funds are a little limited so they're going to try and get away with giving you two balls and, and a lot of times that's fine but if you find yourself getting into a situation where kids are fouling them off uh, and again I'm thinking of East Greenwich again and you're down at a field where they're going out of play and into a neighbor's yard and you've got little kids shagging them and things like that you know try and get three balls from the coaches so that at least you can get out there and keep the game moving we never really want to delay the game because you're waiting on a baseball make sure that you always have one in your bag at all times at least 302 no player shall intentionally discolor or damage the ball by rubbing it with soil rosin paraffin licorice sandpaper emery paper or other foreign substance our old friend Gaylord Perry here master of the spitball always kept a little dab of Vaseline on the brim of his cap you know Little League they don't have any idea even high school kids generally don't have an idea what to do with a doctored ball anyway you're not gonna see this uh, on top of that the balls get dirtied up the balls get scraped up unless there is a chunk missing from the ball or it is really damaged unfortunately we're stuck with using it okay now tournament rules are going to keep a, a fresh supply of baseballs and we're going to really remove any ball that is, is unfit from play but regular season you kinda have to deal with what you get if we find out for some reason that this is something that they're doing intentionally then we need to remove the offender from the pitching position even if you don't know Okay, who discolored the ball, marked it up, did whatever, uh, and the pitcher pitches a pitch, the pitcher's got to go. Okay, he needs to be removed from the pitcher position. He's not ejected, but he is removed and prohibited from pitching. Once the game starts, okay, or I should say when the game starts, uh, 3.03, a player in the starting lineup who has been removed for a substitute may re-enter the game once in any position in the batting order it's a little little bit of a departure from some other uh, some other rule books high school federation rule book as well as the major league rule book a player may only re-enter in their own position in the batting order but a substitute may re-enter in any position 
Okay, but there's some examples here uh, that we'll give you in a second, and there's also some conditions. So the first condition is that you can only re-enter if his or her substitute has completed at least one time at bat and has played defensively for a minimum of six consecutive outs. Okay, for little league. It's important to note that pitchers and catchers, excuse me, pitchers, once removed from the mound, may not return as pitchers. So Little League, no re-enter as a pitcher. However, intermediate and above, juniors, seniors, a pitcher who remains in the game but moves to a different position may return to pitch, but only once. So if John started the game pitching, in the third inning he gets moved to first base, plays two innings at first base and the coach wants to pitch him again, he may. And that's 50-70, intermediate division, and juniors and seniors only. So here's an example about substitutions. Here's our starting lineup. Smith, Jones, Charles, Lee, so forth and so on down the batting order. If we want to sub Jones, uh, excuse me, if we want to pull Jones from the game and put in Davis in the two spot, we certainly can. Furthermore, if we want Jones to re-enter, he can, and again, provided that Davis had completed at least one time at bat and played defensively for a minimum of six consecutive outs. However, once Davis is pulled, since he wasn't a starter, he was a sub, he's done for the game. He may not re-enter. Only a player in the starting lineup may re-enter the game, and that's 303D. Okay? There is a note, and there is one small condition about this. So if during the game either team is unable to place nine players on the field due to something, we tossed a player, which rarely, rarely happens, uh, but more common illness or injury, player doesn't feel well or gets hurt in the game, and they don't have enough players. So if the team only showed up with ten, and one kid had already subbed and was already pulled and is ineligible for re-entry, and one of the starting nine gets hurt, the opposing team may choose that additional player, but it's the opposing manager who makes that choice. So here's the example now. If we've got Jones, who got injured, Davis may actually re-enter via the opposing manager's selection. So let's take a look at some scenarios, and here's our uh, first situation. Prior to the start of the game, the Mets and the Braves exchanged their lineup cards with the batting orders and initial positions. Now, in Little League regular season, we, we don't get lineup cards. We don't have to manage them, but the managers are required to start with a lineup and denote batting order and position whether or not we get a copy. They should at least exchange them. So, in the top of the first now, the Mets light it up. They score eight runs. Okay? They are obviously the away team. Then after that half inning, the Mets decide to save their ace, who was listed as the starter, and send out a different pitcher. Is this okay? Is this legal? So let's go to the rule book on this one and see what we've got. Okay, well, here, here's the first one. It's not legal. <laughs> and this is why. The pitcher named in the batting order handed over to the umpire and chiefs. Again, some 99.9% .9 of the time we don't get a batting order, but the other teams do. Okay, that pitcher who is listed as the starting pitcher shall per shall pitch to the first batter or any substitute batter until such batter or any substitute batter is retired or reaches first base, unless injury, illness, blah 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 blah. But the short answer to this to this question is: Is this legal? And it's not, okay? If they listed their ace, Tom, as the starter, they can't just say, hey, Tom, we got an eight-run lead. Why don't you take this one off? Hey, Jeff, you come in and pitch, okay? They can't do that. And that's 305A. So now some other things about the game. Players, managers, and coaches shall not address or mingle with spectators, nor can they sit in the stands during a game in which they are engaged? Well, this makes sense. The point is we really don't want them up against the fence, talking to the crowd. You know, if they've got a quick question from a mom, is Johnny okay? Or whatever, in a regular season, can you please pass this Gatorade to Timmy? Or something along those lines. That's fine. But the whole point here is that the manager and the two coaches 
are there to coach the game. They're not to hang out with the fans. And we don't want additional information. Maybe there are some other people out there who have been scouting the other teams who are saying, hey man, I watched this kid last week. He's a killer. You should probably intentionally walk him. We don't want any external influences getting into the manager's ears or eyes. Okay? Don't let them talk with the fans. Keep them away from the fence, especially when they are out in the coaches' boxes. You don't want them talking with mom and dad who are hanging out behind first base. Keep them in the game. Also, here's another situation now. Okay? So situation two. Team B was at bat and their catcher was on second base at the end of the inning. Happens all the time. Okay? So in an effort to speed up the game, the manager tells the catcher to hustle in and go get your gear on. The manager then grabs a glove and heads out towards home plate to warm up the pitcher. What's your move here? Right. Well, Little League is very specific about this. Managers or coaches must not warm up a pitcher at home plate or in the bullpen or elsewhere at any time. They may, however, stand by and observe a pitcher during warm-ups in a bullpen area, but they cannot come out and catch for the pitcher to warm up. And this is at any time. This is before the game started. This is during the game. Period. End of discussion. They may not come out. So how do we handle this? Pretty straightforward and pretty simple. Coach, I'm sorry. The league rules don't allow for coaches to warm up pitchers at any time. You can have your pitcher play catch with your third baseman instead. They'll usually look at you once. If they don't know the rule, which is fairly frequent, you will see this at least once a season, if not more. But generally, just talking to them once the first time will will prevent that from uh, happening again. But let them, don't ever let them do it, especially for the new guys who might have a little bit of an issue confronting the coach about this. This is a safety rule. We don't want to see anybody get hurt. We don't want anything bad to happen. There are reasons why this is here. Coaches have gotten hurt in the past, have attempted to sue. Now there are rules against it. Don't be the one that lets the coach go out there. God forbid something happens. Or, just as bad, the next umpire down there gets up to the field and he says, Coach, can't let you do that. And the coach goes, well, the last guy let us do it. We never want that situation. Please don't. Okay. More game preliminaries. The managers of both teams shall agree on the fitness of the playing field before the game starts. Okay. So before the game starts, the two managers have to agree whether or not the field is fit for play. Rained all day. They busted their butt out there. They got bags of quick dry powder out there. They're raking the snot out of this thing. They're squeegeeing it. They're trying to get this thing the field that is ready to play because they don't want to have to reschedule. They're there, they're busting their butt. It's up to the two managers to decide on the safety of that field. If the two managers can't agree, then there's always going to be a league rep or board member at the field to decide. And it's always safety first. Now, once the game starts, the umpire or in this case, umpire-in-chief, says the rule book, shall be the sole judge as to whether and when play shall be suspended because of unsuitable weather conditions or the unfit conditions of the playing field. Okay. If the two managers are out there, they're busting their butt, they're scraping this up, they're, we had a torrential downpour earlier, <clears throat> and they just can't get the field dry, but they say, you know what, Blue, we're going to play anyway. You look at the field and you go, Oof, I don't know about that. Somebody could potentially get hurt. There's still a puddle. There's still mud. Kids could slip and slide around, throw out throw out a knee. It, hell, you know, if there's puddles at home plate that still aren't there, you could blow out a knee back there, and we don't want that to happen. So you can offer a little suggestion like, Coach, I don't feel good about it. If you think, you know, you want to start it like that, I'll let you know right now that I don't think it's fit for play. I can't prevent you from starting the game, but as soon as that, as soon as I say play and that pitch comes in, I can kill it right then and there. So you do have a little bit of a say in the matter. You don't want to go out there and kill the game just because you don't want to be there. Give them every chance. And the whole idea really is, again, to get the game in, to let the kids play. So, when 
or as to whether and when play shall be resumed, okay, the umpire gets that call. So we had a downpour, everybody's in the dugouts, we look at the field, field needs a little bit of attention, okay, they get basically 30 minutes to get that field in order. When we say, okay, we think it's going to be stopping, it's lighting up, uh, the radar shows that it's just a quick passing thunderstorm, let's go out there. We still have to wait 30 minutes until after play has been suspended. So these kids are hanging around for half an hour anyway, since I suspended play. Let's get the field ready and get it moving. Okay. Since we're talking about weather, let's take a quick little segue into some harsh weather guidelines, specifically related to lightning and thunder. So first off, when should activities be stopped? Okay, what's the general rule? Well, Little League doesn't have a hard and set rule on this, but they do make some pretty good suggestions. Right? First of all, obviously, we're concerned about safety of the people. So pouring rain, we see lightning. Even if it's not pouring, even if we see lightning, okay, we're talking a 6 to 10 mile radius. That's a, a pretty big area of space. So if we see lightning, the ability to see lightning varies depending upon the time of day, obviously, weather conditions, and obstructions such as trees. If we've got a clear air at night and we see lightning, okay, it can be seen from more than 10 miles away. But if you're in a little bit of a daytime and you see a big bolt of lightning and you hear a thunderclap shortly thereafter, you probably want to do something instantly. Okay? So general rule of thumb is if lightning is visible in the area stop the game check the time if you can clear the field err on the side of caution what about thunder well generally if thunder can be heard it's can be heard within a distance of about 10 miles so if you hear something distant and you know all the distance uh, excuse me you all know the difference between distant thunder and something that you know, crashes over your head and, and rattles your, your brain a little bit, uh, that concussive thunder. So we, as soon as we hear thunder, we want to take a look around and we want to kind of monitor that. But if you hear thunder, that storm is within 10 miles. And within 6 to 10 miles, we pretty much want to make sure that we're erring on the side of caution. Okay? So again, let's wait for thunder. Rain's coming. Lightning is probably inevitable, especially in the summertime when these games are played. So be ready for that. Situation number three now. Game's in the bottom of the fifth. Field does not have lights. Sunset is scheduled for 15 minutes from now. The sky gets really dark really fast. Rain begins and thunder and lightning are heard and seen. What should the umpire do at this point? Okay. Well, first thing he wants to do is clear the field. But now we need to think about this for a little bit. We know that there's no lights. We know that once we clear the field, we must wait for 30 minutes before we could restart a game at a minimum. So even if we said 30 minutes from now we're going to restart, sundown is in 15 minutes. 15 minutes after sundown, are you really going to be able to get the game in? So at that point, since we're in the bottom of the fifth and it is a regulation game, Okay, we can call the game from that point. Okay. Now, up ahead, I believe when we get into rule number four, you're going to see some situations about what happens when and who scores and who wins when we get into a situation where the game has to be called. 3.12. When the umpire suspends play, time shall be called. At the umpire's call of play, the suspension is lifted and play resumes. Between the call of time and the call of play, the ball is dead. Well, no kidding. <laughs> okay, but look, especially new umpires, be sure that you are putting the ball back in play. Understand when the ball becomes dead and understand when you need to put the ball back in play because nothing can happen. Okay? If you've got time and then you go out and you stand behind the catcher and the pitcher pitches the ball, you're still in a dead ball situation. I understand that you're going to let this go and yes, we all forget to put the ball back in play. It happens. 
but this is a really strong mechanic and it will save you from a lot of crap because next kid comes up pitcher pitches the ball kid hits a home run now we're in a bad place okay because you didn't put the ball back in play and the other manager comes out and says you never put the ball back in play there's no convention or codicil in the rule book that says anything like oh the pitcher by the act of pitching initiated play so the ball was in play uh uh okay you got a problem make sure you're putting the ball back in play okay 3-0 game preliminaries now we're getting into some rules here regarding safety and liability so be careful Players and substitutes shall sit on their team's benches or in the dugout unless participating in the game or preparing to enter the game. Don't let the kids wander around. Don't let the kids go outside the fence. If they've got to run to the restroom or something, fine. But don't let them hang out. Don't let them warm up. Don't let them play catch off the side. Don't let them hang out with their buddies. Okay. No one except eligible players in uniform, a manager, and not more than two coaches, shall occupy the bench or dugout. Bat boys and or bat girls are not permitted. So what do we see at least once a year in this situation? We see Coach Dad, who is coming down to the game with his little league-aged 11-year-old son. Mrs. Coach Dad is not home from work yet, so he's also got in tow his four or five-year-old daughter. Can she sit in the dugout? No. Don't worry, I'll put a helmet on her. She'll be my bat girl. Also, no. Do not let anybody else other than players or coaches enter the dugout. If balls, bats, stupid things happen, and things happen in that dugout all the time, how many times have we all looked over and seen some kid crying in the dugout and go, what the heck just happened over there? Well, he picked up a bat, he tripped, he fell, somebody hit him with something they shouldn't have been doing. Do not open yourself up to the liability of letting somebody else get injured in that dugout. 3.17 also continued. The use of electronic communication equipment during the game is restricted. No team shall use electronic communication equipment, including walkie-talkies, cellular telephones, etc., blah, 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 blah. The penalty is, if in the umpire's judgment any player, manager, or coach is using his electronic communication devices during the game, the penalty is ejection. All right, so what's the reality here? The, this rule and the purpose of this rule is to prevent coaches from talking to perhaps base coaches, perhaps people outside the fence, who see something on the field and want to relay it into the coach. Hey, Tom, you got to watch this kid. He's playing shallow or he's doing something or he's stepping out of the box when he swings or whatever it happens to be. We want none of that. We don't want any kind of communication. Now, the problem with this is, is that people have lives and they do this on a volunteer basis. So in a lot of situations, we'll see a coach or a manager who is on call for work or if they're a doctor and there's an emergency. Okay, cell phones are part of our culture, unfortunately. But we need to, if we see a coach on the cell phone, say, Coach, you need to step outside the dugout. Okay, the rule here is pretty straightforward. But we have to give them the benefit of the doubt that they're not using the phone at that point for any kind of illegal activity or cheating or anything along those lines. They cannot be on the field with a phone in their hand, period. That's just pure safety violation. If they're on the phone, they're not paying attention. A foul ball comes screaming at them. I don't even want to see what happens next. Okay, But in the dugout, forget it. No phones. Coach, you got to step out of the dugout. You can't be on the phone or your team's on the field. And guess what? If he's the only coach in the dugout because they're short that day, He's got to get off the phone, and you should hold play until he does it. And if he refuses to get off the phone, then we've got a penalty involved here. But give him the benefit of the doubt.
And that's all we have for rule number three. Okay? Uh, as always, I just took selected excerpts out of here. I, I probably got about 80% of that rule. But it is uh, there's a lot of data in there and a lot of wording that I just glanced over. So do yourself the favor, as always, go back, read the rule book, understand these, and understand the intent of the rules as well. So if something like 317 happens and you have a coach on the phone, you understand the content of the rule, why it's there, and if you have any questions, let us know. Talk to an experienced guy. They'll let you know what the situation was when it happened to them in the past. We've seen just about every single one of these rules come up and why we need to enforce them. Thanks for your time.